What's up guys? This is Trevor the Great here again from Way of the Swan with another awesome battle report for you guys. And this one's going to be pretty special. There is no Signar on the table today. Mind blowing, I know. Uh, for those of many of you know, I am a press ganger in New England. I run a lot of steamrollers and tournaments for uh, the New England meta. And this is a video from uh, one of the local events that I ran. This was for a hardcore event. Uh, for those who don't know, hardcore is a very fast paced format of um, a war machine. It's based around making quick decisions and uh, getting up in the middle of the table, getting your opponent's face, and hopefully killing their caster. Uh, you know, th most hardcore events end up being just being a giant mosh pit in the center of the board uh, where everybody fights and beats the crap of each other until somebody dies. Uh, they are one list events, and so I decided to try to alleviate the weird matchups that uh, arise from one list events as much as possible using the specialist variant from Steamroller. So players were allowed to take an extra 10 points of their army uh, and then swap that in and out depending on the matchup that they hit. Hopefully so that they avoid any very, very bad matchups or sort of auto-lose auto situations uh, from that one list format arise, rearing its ugly head. Um, the hardcore format uses one scenario, it's called the deathmatch scenario, and I'll go over it a little bit in a little bit more detail later on. It also uses seven minute time turns, so that the games are very, very fast and over very, very quickly, and there's not a lot of time to think or plan out uh, any um, you know, mind-bending strategies. Uh, so I like the format because I can run it in a very short amount of time and when I'm playing in it, it's super fast and it's super fast-paced and a pretty lighthearted and I do enjoy it quite a bit. So the matchup today, this is the semi-finals of the event. Uh, as it was the semi-finals and with a troll player on the side of the table using a lot of tough checks and things like that, the players asked me to come in and uh, run the clock for them and pause it you know, whenever we needed to. So that meant I was able to watch most of the game, so hopefully I'll give a little bit of insight into what's going on in the game. Although, uh, caveat, I didn't actually play this game, so I can't um, really get into the heads of the players too much, uh, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, anyway, we have Assyria, the Sybil of Dawn, versus Doomshaper 1, the Shaman of the Gnarls. Uh, Doomshaper 1 is bringing a Tier 4 Runes of War list, as is his want. Uh, he is bringing a pretty standard theme force for Doomshaper. Uh, the Doomshaper player decided to swap out the Dire Troll Mauler that's usually in the, the Doomshaper theme force for a Pyre Troll, a unit of Whelps, and a Trollkin Runebearer. The, um... Um, Dire Troll Mahler is basically there as another heavy and for the Rage Animus and I think my uh, the, the Doom Shaper player decided that the additional AoE from the Pyre Troll was going to be a little bit more effective uh, as well as not really needing that um, plus three strength from Rage in order to kill any of the Retribution models. There's not a lot of too heavy armor on the Retribution side, nothing big like a Hyperion or something like that that could really need Rage to kill it. Um, so that brings the uh, Doom Shaper list into Doom Shaper 1. In his battle group is Mulg the Ancient, a Dire Troll, or an Earthborn Dire Troll, a Troll Axer, and a Pyre Troll, as well as a Trollkin Rune Bearer attached to Doom Shaper. There are four units of Rune Shapers. Now remember, the Rune Shapers are going to get a minus one points cost uh, from the Theme Force benefit. So they are going to be very, very cheap. They're only three points a unit. There's also a Max Creel Stone with the unit attachment, the Stone Scribe Elder, Janissa Stone Tide, and as I said before, uh, one group of little whips. Uh, the theme force benefits for this theme force are pretty good. Um, they give an additional two inches of deployment on the uh, trophy player side. So Doom Sheeper is going first in this matchup, so he's going to be deploying nine inches off the table, which is pretty significant for that big slow battle group. There are um, one wall for every two Rune Shaper units gets to be placed with, completely within 20 inches of the table edge, uh, not within three inches of any other terrain. Now, inter interestingly enough, that means that they can be placed inside of zones in the 2014 rules. 2015 may change that a little bit, uh, but we can't really say for sure right now. But that means that, uh, as it stands, those boar beasts are going to be very, very good at contesting because they can get into that zone behind that wall and uh, just sit there with cover and just be really annoying. Cover and probably elemental communion from the Earthborn Dire Troll to give them an additional plus two armor on top of the Krillstone. Uh, last but not least, the Krillstone receives Fury for each Rune Shaper unit or solo in the army, uh, meaning that it starts the game mostly filled up and Doom Shaper can get his uh, upkeeps out on the first turn without having to worry about all that. Uh, the Retribution player, 
uh, was bringing a pretty standard retribution list. Assyria is not usually the caster that's taken in a hardcore format. She tends to be uh, very, very uh, dominant in the alpha strike, but she has absolutely no game, no late game potential whatsoever. And hardcore uh, being a fast format and very central uh, with a, a strong kill box means that a lot of players tend to take the beefy um, sort of frontline fight fighty casters, something like Viros 2 maybe, or Gareth, and uh, Assyria is not that. She has no offensive abilities whatsoever, very little defensive abilities. Uh, she is more in defensive than offensive, but she's still um, not the tankiest caster in the entire game. Uh, and she can't actually kill anyone. So if the attrition battle goes poorly for the uh, Retribution player, they, it's not really, really going to matter. Or it's... It isn't going to matter. Uh, it's not going to be very good for the uh, for the Assyria player because she can't really fight back into the game using her own abilities. She, her only offensive spell is Blinding Light, and it does zero damage. Uh, however, that said, the Deathmatch scenario does play right into where Assyria wants to be. She wants your opponent to be very centrally located and have to be up the table so she can feat an alpha really hard with guns and fast melee with Crusader's Call. And that's what the Retribution player's list is designed to do here. Uh, it has um, uh, Assyria running a Banshee and Discordia. Discordia was swapped out for a Phoenix in this game. Uh, I think the Retribution player was more worried about the uh, heavy melee hitting of the Phoenix as well as the, um, the long range gun instead of Discordia's range defensive ability which isn't really going to do much against a troll player. Um, she also has a Banshee in her battle group. There is a maximum unit of Mage Hunter Strike Force with their unit attachment, the Strike Force Commander, to give them uh, Phantom Seeker. There is a maximum unit of Dawn Guard Sentinels with their unit attachment. Uh, a, two units of Stormfall Archers, lots of guns. A, an Arcanist, as well as um, two Mage Hunter Assassins. So obviously, lots of ranged attacks from those Strike Force and the Stormfall Archers, as well as the Warjacks. Uh, followed up by very, very heavy melee from that battle group and the Dawnguard Sentinels. So a good one-two punch, and uh, we'll see how it goes in this matchup. The uh, scenario for this game is going to be Deathmatch, because it is hardcore, it only uses one scenario. Uh, and there's a boatload of text in this scenario, but the general gist of it is that it's a single... 12 inch diameter zone in the direct center of the table. Um, players who control that or, or dominate it on the second, after the second player's second turn will not only score themselves pressure points, which don't really do anything except uh, break ties if the game does go to dice down. There's a master clock running in the background, and once that goes off, then the uh, player with the most pressure points will win the game if nobody's caster has died at that point. However, uh, controlling or dominating the zone will also damage your opponent's Warcaster. They'll take 5 damage if you control, an additional 2 if you dominate, and they won't be able to uh, heal or make tough checks or transfer damage for one round. So not a place that any Warcaster really wants to be. It, additionally, there is a kill box. The kill box doesn't seed control points or kill your caster, but what it does do is deal 5 damage to them, uh, as well as the effects that uh, dominating the zone does, so no transfers, no healing, none of that. Um, that makes it very, very dangerous to killbox yourself, especially if you're um, down in attrition and your opponent can control the zone, you can end up losing your caster very quickly. And even a Warlock, uh, who can usually transfer damage, uh, bereft of that ability, can die very, very quickly. As I said before, players are playing on 7 minute clocks, so the game is going to be very fast paced, not a lot of thinking, and a lot of acting. So let's get into this game and see what happens. So here we are in deployment. As I said before, I didn't play this game, but the players did ask me to run the clock for them, because uh, mainly because the troll player uh, had a bunch of tough checks and things to make, which made the clock very awkward on a seven minute time limit. So I didn't actually play this game, so I can't give you a ton of insight into why the players made the moves that they did, but I was there for most of the game, so I can uh, at least retell the battle a little bit uh, in a little bit of detail. Uh, as we can see, we, everything is deployed out here, uh, Doomshaper deploying in a very standard manner, his battle group in the center with the Creelstone and Janissa and the Rune Shapers on each side. Uh, looks like the Earthborn Dire Trolls off on one flank there. Uh, he might actually be proxied in the center, but I'm not sure. Um, and you, this is a pretty standard deployment for a Runes of War army. Those Rune Shapers are going to try to cloud up in front of the battle group to block charge lanes and things like that and just be an annoying screen. 
They do, uh, if they're in range to get it from Janissa, they get Force Lock, which can make them a very, very effective screen, and they can fight other infantry very well with their Rock Hammer spell. The Retro Region deployment is also very standard. Uh, the battle group is all centered. That's going to be a very important uh, piece in order to be a, a second punch into the troll lines. Uh, as well as the Dawn Guard Sentinels back there, with the Mage Hunter Strike Force up uh, very, very far up on the AD line. Because they have Phantom Hunter, they can shoot through those uh, walls and forests and all the models in the way. Uh, that means that they're going to be able to target uh, support models like the Creel Stone, so they're going to be very dangerous in this matchup to the Troll player. Everything's moving up. As I said before, the Creel Stone gets full up on Fury most of the way because of the Theme Force benefit, so it's going to end up putting up its Protective Aura. Uh, and running up, everything else just spreading out in front of the army. Uh, I guess the Earthborn Dire Troll is actually out there on the flank, doing performing an extreme flanking maneuver. Um, it does get plus two armor from that house there, so it is going to um, be able to get plus two armor by just sitting next to that big obstacle. So fortunate, hopefully it's not going to be too far out there. And then the Pyre Troll moving back, uh, or moving up in the back there, mainly just to give the Animus out and throw some AoEs out as an additional infantry clearer on top of the Rune Shapers. So the Retribution player is moving up, spreading out his models. The uh, Mage Hunter Strike Force doesn't want to get too close. They are going to take some shots. They're going to be Dice Planet 7 because of the Creel Stone Aura on those Rune Shapers. Not a great odds of doing damage, but every shot counts, especially in a time turn environment like this where. You're not really losing anything taking those attacks um, as long as you can activate the rest of your army in time. So uh, there's no reason not to, to take those shots. Uh, doing a couple points of damage to some Rune Shapers as well, as along with the Stormfall Archers. The uh, Retribution does player doesn't want to get those Strike Force too close. The Troll player doesn't really have the range to threaten them too far. The Rune Shapers, uh, Rock Hammers are going to be very, very powerful. However, with Stealth, the um, Strike Force aren't going to be in too much danger just from the blast damage. And uh, the Retribution player really wants them to get forward and start tagging those um, those support models and perhaps even threatening Doom Shaper. So not a lot of damage traded this turn because mainly it's just running up and taking a couple pot shots. Now this is where things get a little dicey in a 7 minute time turn because... Um, the Rune Shapers all have a, a range 8 AoE 3 power 14 spell called Rock Hammer that they can cast. So we're going to be diving in a ton of AoEs and on top of that there's also the 8 Stormfall Archers on the Retribution side. So there's an enormous number of AoEs getting thrown in this particular matchup. Unfortunately the Retribution player is going to be on the losing side of that battle because he's got a lot of lighter infantry that's going to be blown up by those Rock Hammers and things like that. Um, so as you can see some of the Strike Force getting taken out by AoEs there. Every little bit counts, and those Rune Shapers are going to be pretty safe from any retaliation from them. Uh, they'll have to worry about the Stormfall Archers at power 12, but the power 10 bows from the uh, Strike Force aren't going to do much to armor 17 as long as they're in the Krillstone Aura. is putting her wall up in front of Mulg, and then the Pyre Troll is putting um, his Animus on Janissa. That's going to keep her safe from the Phoenix Gun, as well as the Starfire uh, arrows from the Stormfall Archers, if they decide to shoot those. And then the Stone saying no continuous effects to stop the Phoenix, as well as those Stormfall Archers arrows. And then uh, putting Protective War up. There are two Mage Hunter Assassins off the screen to the bottom there. That's where these Rune Shapers are throwing their, um, their Rock Hammers. The Mage Hunter Assassins are going to be very, very... Uh, dangerous to the Rune Shapers because their decapitation ability stops uh, their target from taking tough checks. So as a weapon master with decapitation, they're going to be able to do a lot of damage and just take those Rune Shapers out of the game one by one. Um, so here we go into the Retribution turn. Assyria is feeding this turn. She's putting a blinding light onto that front unit of Rune Shapers through the Phoenix uh, and then targeting them with all sorts of attacks. So what the Assyria player's plan here is is to uh, use the feet to alpha as hard as he can with guns and try to take out as many of the rune shapers as possible and as many of the support of this list as possible. As you may know, Trolls is very, very dependent on its support. Uh, things like the Krill Stone and Fell Collars and Stone Scribe Chronicles all make the army uh, tick. So those Strike Force being able to shoot through all the models, uh, especially with the extra dice from a serious feat, so they're hitting and damaging um, pretty reliably, was able to kill most of the Krill Stone. 
So that is not where the uh, troll player wants to um, be sitting. And then the strike for uh, the assassins are going in and taking out uh, two of the rune shapers, forcing a third one to flee in that unit. Um, and then the sentinels moving up. No, the sentinels aren't going to be much used this turn. But uh, the retribution player did throw one up in front of Mulg there, the standard bearer, because he doesn't have an attack. So if Mulg kills him to get out of the way, uh, then the rest of the unit's going to vengeance and probably be in charge range next turn. And without uh, many fury left in that creel stone. Um, because it is being shot, having a crap shot out of it. It's, uh, the, those war beasts without the Creelstone aura are probably not going to be very, uh, resilient to power 12 up master attacks, and they're probably going to die eventually. The Phoenix taking his cannon shot into Janissa. Now, um, the troll player did put the Pyro Trolls Animus on Janissa, so she's not going to take any damage from the AoE because of... Uh, it's uh, damage type fire. It does, however, kill the last remaining stone scribe, so that is going to wipe out the Krill Stone unit. A huge, huge play on the Retribution player's part. That means that whole army is going to effectively minus two armor, and once the troll army loses the support of the Krill Stone, which is really based around, uh, it starts to fall apart pretty quickly. Those war beasts are, are still resilient, but not nearly as resilient as they were with plus two armor and immunity to continuous effects. Um, so the Retribution player has also done a very good job at keeping the majority of his troops back. All those Yonderguard Sentinels are, are still in the back line, waiting for um, Assyria to cast Crusader's Call and give the command to go ahead and charge in there. Uh, some of the Rune Shapers moving over and taking out more of the a, um, Strike Force. We made a mistake here, and the unit of uh, Rune Shapers that had been blinding lighted actually were making um, Rock Hammer attacks. Again, seven minute time turns, things tend to get um, tend to get forgotten, and that's actually my fault for being at the table and just completely forgetting as well. I'm not very particularly used to Assyria. She doesn't usually cast Blinding Light when I play against her. Uh, she either doesn't get the chance or it's just not really workable. Um, but anyway, that's most of the strike force taken out by those rock hammers and the uh, the dire troll axer or the, the troll axer right there. Um, the Phoenix has admonition on it, um, I think, but it's choosing not to trigger it because there's nothing really in range to do anything. And then there is the Pyre Troll shooting his, um, shooting his AoE, Doom Shaper feeding to prevent any, uh, significant retaliation by Assyria on those Warjacks, at least retaliation without taking a ton of damage from, uh, spending focus. And he's sitting on a ton of fury. And that's pretty much the Trollkin player's turn. There's not a lot else to do here. Uh, he screened his war beasts pretty well, so the Retribution player is probably going to have to spend a turn to chew through those the remaining Rune Shapers and that Axer in order to get to Mog or the Earthborn. And uh, I just don't think he's going to be able to do um, all of those things all at once. Although he probably is going to kill the remaining Rune Shapers as well as the Axer. Uh, with those Dawn Guard Sentinels and the Stormfall Archers that are all sitting in the back there. Uh, so there is the Phoenix going, taking a shot at Janissa, actually killing her off. I think that's what happened, uh, unless she's behind that tree there. The Stormfall Archers taking brutal damage shots at those uh, Rune Shapers who last turn were Blinding Lighted and taking them off the table pretty easily, uh, taking some additional shots into the Pyre Troll. Here are some Dawn Guard Sentinels going, triggering a free strike from the Axer, which uh, the Trokin player decides to take and kills off that Dawn Guard Sentinel. And then the remaining Sentinels just charging in to the Rune Shapers and the Axer right there, hopefully taking that beast out. So without a serious feat, these guys aren't rolling as well as they could have been. Um, and the Dawn Guard Sentinels actually fail to take out that Axer. Now that's going to be huge because the Axer has Thresher, so it's going to be able to make an attack uh, as a special attack against every single one of those Dawn Guard Sentinels in uh, melee with it. So it's going to be able to wipe out most of those. Now the Retribution player did keep several of them back behind that house there, still uh, in the back and without a lot of ranged attacks um, besides the Pyre Troll and those Rune Shapers being taken out. The Troll player isn't really going to be able to deal with them. He's going to have to deal with the ones in his face and then take another charge from another uh, set of them next turn, although there's only going to be a couple. Um, a couple more Stormfall Archers shooting into the remaining Rune Shapers in the side there that were take going after the Assassins uh, and taking them out. I think that leaves one Rune Shaper in the center 
uh, that's just towing in the zone closer to the camera, and I, I think he's fleeing, although I don't remember off the top of my head. And then I think that is some more Stormfall Archer shots into the um, Earthborn. Assyria moving back, camping a bunch of focus. And uh, that was the, there was one uh, Mage Hunter Strike Force charging there uh, into something, a whelp, I think, something like that. Oh no, I'm sorry, into the Pyro Troll. Uh, definitely not a whelp. The uh, last remaining Mage Hunter, uh, Mage Hunter Strike Force member charged into the Pyro Troll, and uh, along with the shot from the Banshee and the Stormfall Archer, brutal damage shots were able to take it out. Uh, so that is the Pyro Troll down. The Axers making an enormous Thresher attack into the Dawn Guard Sentinels, taking out tons of them. Uh, so that unit is going to be significantly neutered, although Vengeance is triggered uh, for a second turn. It's going to be difficult not to trigger Vengeance at this point, because almost anywhere you go, you're going to be inundated by Dawnguard Sentinels. But uh, that is enormous for that Axer. That means, uh, although he's not sitting on many hit points, he did make a lot of his, uh, a lot of headway back in there. Um, so, uh, Doom Shaper went and cast Rush on both Mulg and the Earthborn. The Earthborn's making a slam power attack into the Phoenix. Now the Phoenix, uh, I think, was um, admonitioned. I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it was admonitioned and the um, the Retribution player just didn't um, trigger it for whatever reason. Uh, I, it might've just been a time crunch. So the slam did knock the Phoenix down and the Earthborn was able to do a ton of damage to it. Uh, the or a Mulg is declaring a trample. He's trampling over the, a single Dawn Guard Sentinel there, as well as the Mage Hunter Strike Force member. Uh, we're just checking the trample lane to make sure it's good. And he's killing the Dawn Guard Sentinel. Um, not provoking a free strike from the Mage Hunter Strike Force. Being knocked over because he's huge. And then buying additional attacks into the, um, into the Banshee. He did take out the Phoenix with a couple bot attacks and filling himself up in order to knock out as much of the Phoenix as possible. Uh, Mog rolled very well onto the uh, onto the Phoenix to take it out, but unfortunately did not roll quite as well onto the Banshee uh, and was not able to kill it, although he did knock it down with a critical smite, I think. Um, the Banshee does have reach, though, so it's going to be able to sacrifice its movement and stand up and just beat up on Mog uh, that turn. Um, so Assyria... Uh, we had an issue where Assyria tried to throw Blinding Light onto the Earthborn Dire Troll to make it easier to hit by those Stormfall Archers, and unfortunately, uh, Blinding Light is only target warrior model, so Assyria wasn't able to uh, make that uh, spell, to, to use that spell, um, and how that actually works is that if you declare a spell on an illegal target, you are forced to choose a different target for the spell because you declare you're casting the spell before you declare your target. Uh, so she's still, still supposed to cast the spell, and if she's not able to, uh, she's not able to um, cast the spell at all, and she's actually basically just um, chooses a target that's out of range and misses. Um, so unfortunately, Assyria blowing a couple focus there. Uh, again, the time crunch in hardcore is very apparent um, and makes things a little bit awkward sometimes. The remaining Dawnguard Sentinels are able to get a couple choice ch uh, charges off on Mulg and deal a bunch of damage to him, as well as take out the Troll Axer. Uh, finally, the Troll Axer goes down, and Mulg, uh, between the Sentinels and the Banshee's attacks, is taken out as well. So that is two heavy hitters down on the... Um, on the Troll Blood side, there's just basically an Earthborn Dire Troll left. Not a lot of Fury Generation for Doom Shapers. So things aren't looking too great for the uh, Troll player. However, you have to remember that um, against the Siri, you're almost never out of the game. Because if you can make a play and uh, make, make a big play and do a bunch of damage, uh, Assyria is not going to be able to really threaten you herself. She can't really get any work done herself without any offensive abilities. So um, if you can get up on attrition against her, um, or, or at least get to a point where her army can't kill you, uh, you're in a pretty good spot because Assyria can't really fight her way back in. So if Doomshaper can kill, continue to kill Retribution models, if she can take out that, that take out that Banshee uh, and try to take out some of those archers, he might still have a have a game here. If the Earthborn just sits next to that wall, sits at armor 20, um, and just uh, 
continues to beat up on dudes, it might turn out okay. Unfortunately, the Retribution Blair has put a, a wall of models between the Banshee and the Earthborn, and the Earthborn, despite having huge fists, doesn't have reach. So he's not able, he's not gonna be able to get onto the Banshee without a little bit of uh, trampling action going on here, which is exactly what he's doing. Um, uh, unfortunately, the troll player, uh, a little bit of time crunch, decided to, to move the model before trampling. And uh, so we had a little bit of discussion between whether a Dongar Sentinel would have a free strike and whether the trample lane that he chose would actually bring him into melee with the Banshee. Uh, at the end, we decided that the free strike wouldn't get taken and that the um, that the Earthborn would have a, uh, a, a be able to attack the Banshee. So he does end up killing a couple more Dawn Guard Sentinels. Um, fills up on Fury to try to kill the Banshee and ends up not scrapping it. That Banshee has uh, inviolable resolve on it, so it's an armor 21 Warjack right now, which is um, the reason for it being so tanky right now, actually. Tanking both Mulg's attacks and the Earthborn's attacks. Uh, Doom Shaper just taking some uh, Stranglehold shots into the um, some of the models around there, some of the remaining Dying Guard Sentinels and just taking them out. Forcing a command check. Uh, but with the Banshee still operational, I think both of its arms were knocked out by those attacks, but there's an Arcanist there sitting right next to it, so he's going to come around to try to take his uh, repair check. Passes the repair check, and with three focus, uh, is able to kill the Earthborn Dire Troll, and uh, Asiri is able to start scoring the zone. Without any other models on the table, Doomshaper is not able to contest the zone, and uh, he ends up taking damage every single turn until he's dead. And until, unless he can kill Assyria, which the Assyria player is obviously not going to let him do, uh, especially because Doom Shaper's main offensive uh, spell is Stranglehold, and it, she can just Arcane Vortex that away so that he doesn't, uh, he isn't able to even to roll the attack, then he's not really able to get back in the game. And Assyria is going to be able to dominate uh, the three times that she needs to win. And uh, that is the end of the game. So that is the semifinals of the hardcore that I ran. Uh, Retribution wins the game, and uh, the Retribution player in the finals will be playing against Crix. So I will have another battle report up for you guys very, very soon. Uh, another hardcore battle report between this very same Retribution list and uh, some Crix led by Gorshade 3. So stay tuned for that. I hope you guys enjoyed this battle report. Again, take a look at my channel. You can like or subscribe, all that stuff, if you like what you see. And uh, keep it classy, my friends.